Hello, it's me, Johanna, and I'm here today to explain Psychology 5.1. This is actually part two of 5.1, which is all about social identity theory. So in this video, I'm going to start doing it in the more revision-friendly way. So first I'll explain what the concept is, and then I'll go through a full study to do with the concept so that if you're on an exam, you'll have both, I know what this is, but also I know a study related to it. Social identity theory refers to the assumption that humans have not only, or do not have, sorry, I don't know why I wrote it like that, um, have only a personal self, but also several social selves that are corresponding to the said persons in groups. So for instance, um, I consider myself to be a part of a specific friend group, and in that friend group, I discuss certain topics and we act in certain ways. Meanwhile, while I'm talking to other people in my class, I might act in a slightly different way. Or I am part of a dance team and that is one of my in-groups, so I act in a certain way there. There are multiple different versions of yourself. You can think about how you act in front of your parents versus how you act in front of your friends. It's very different. So before we get into the study, let's go through some definitions you'll need to know. So social categorization. So essentially what this is, is when you put people in certain groups because of similar characteristics, similar preferences, similar, any similarity, and you can group them into groups. And this is something that a lot of people believe happens automatically. You just see someone and you're like, oh, um, like for instance, gender. So in groups, that is the group you're in. Out groups are a group you are not part of. So it's us versus them. Then there is in-group favoritism slash positive distinctiveness. This is essentially when you favor your own group and you or anything they stand for, anything they do, you stand behind it. There's also negative distinctiveness, which is when you're against anything a group you're not a part of does. So the study I have chosen to teach you is Teufel et al. from 1971. This is because I think it's quite iconic, if you will. He was, Teufel, was one of those people, well, psychologists, that came up with most of these con concepts that we talk about. For instance, positive distinctiveness and negative distinctiveness. So I think this study is very interesting. Also, um, it talks about discrimination and how discrimination can happen even though you are in a very minimal group. The aim of this study was to investigate if intergroup discrimination would happen when you place people or participants into random groups. So the sample used was 48 boys aged 14 to 15 and they were all from I think a British boarding school or a British school of some type. The procedure used sounds a bit confusing however it is actually quite simple when you fully understand it. So first um, they asked the boys to rate 12 paintings that were by Klee or Klee? I don't really know how to say it, or Kandinsky, and these were like abstract painters. Now, on the paintings, it didn't say who painted what, so the boys didn't know who painted what when they were rating them. So they would rate them, and then they were randomly allocated, so randomly, into two different groups, and they were just told, oh, your group preferred Kandinsky, your group preferred Klee. Klee? Okay, honestly, I have no idea how to say that. Um, so I just want to make that clear. They were not put in groups based on what paintings they actually liked. They were put in groups based on nothing. It was completely random. Then each boy was asked to reward points to two other boys. One of the boys was someone from their in-group, so if they liked Kandinsky, then one of the people was a person who liked Kandinsky, and then the other person they had to rate was someone who liked Klee. So the only information they got about these other boys was like a code that referred to like the participant. So it was like two, three, five, or I don't know how they were, but you know, like some code name. And then it also said which group the person was from. Now, when I say rate or like award points, I don't know what they were actually awarding points for. They were just like randomly giving out points. It's like, do you want to give this person points? Um, and there were two different ways or two different systems used to reward points. So system one was to 
that all of the points given by each person had to add up to 15. So if you were there and you gave one person 5 points, then the other person automatically got 10 points. Then the other system of rewarding points was essentially that the higher points you gave to your own group would give more profit to your out group. So essentially, if you gave lower numbers to the people in your in-group, the other group would get lower scores as well. It was essentially like that. Um, so all the participants did that. Um, then the results were that for the first system of awarding points, participants were more likely to give people in their in-group way higher points than people in the out-group. For the second system of rewarding points, um, participants were more likely to give their own group less points in order to maximize the difference between the in-group and the out-group. You know, they were like essentially trying to like win the game by like getting lower, giving their, giving the out-group lower points by giving their own group lower points. You know, there was some, some interesting tactics going on there. Um, uh, so, what are the conclusions that we can draw from this? So, possible conclusions that can be made based on this study is that the positive and negative distinctiveness does actually happen and that discrimination can happen within minimal groups. So, an evaluation of the study is that it has a high level of control, it has a low level of ecological value because the tasks that they were asked to do are not very natural and wouldn't happen in a real-life situation. I don't think there are very many 14-year-old boys that go and rate paintings and then divide themselves into groups and then rate each other. I mean, that's a bit weird. Um, also, some of the boys like essentially tried to win, so they interpreted the task as a competition, so obviously that can allow for demand characteristics. Um, there is also sampling bias because everybody was a, a male, everybody was either 14 or 15, and they were all British, so you can't really generalize past that. Does it work for women? So on and so forth. You know, there's all of that. So now that we've gone through everything and you have like an understanding of what social identity theory is, we're going to evaluate the entire theory. So not the study. We're evaluating the social identity theory. So some things that are important is that this theory does not explain why some group identities are stronger than others. It can also be seen as quite reductionistic. This is because if you have this theory in isolation, it doesn't consider the environment you are in when you're interacting with these people. So like if you're in a school and all the expectations that are put on you and stuff like that. So that was it for part two of the identity and the group. So. I mean the individual and the group. So please feel free to like, subscribe, and comment. You can follow me at Johanna Frenert on Instagram. Um, I just changed my hair, so you can go check that out if you want. Uh, goodbye. I hope you learned something.